Hello, everybody. Dave Finale here. This is episode 71, episode 71 of Real Estate Talk TGIF. We all know what TGIF stands for. Thank God it's Finale. And we know that's true. <laughs> it is also Friday, which makes the F work and whatever. I'm so pleased to have uh, a guy I've seen speak many, many times. Uh, just recently met um, uh, J-Man. Jeremiah's Monera, and here he is. Uh, J-Man, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Thanks for having me. to watch. You've got so much great stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. I greatly appreciate it. So so your journey started many, many years ago. I'm making it sound like you're a million years old like me. but Many, many years ago. Many, yes. many years ago, right? But uh, one of the things you say in, in your stuff in, in, on your site, too, is, that you started your public speaking when you were eight, right? So tell us that story and then and then go into, you know, where you were, you know, after high school and what are and through and where you are today. So tell us that story. All right. Once upon a time, there was a young man named Jeremiah. I uh, know. So my elementary school, we had a circus and not like a circus with wild animals or anything like that. But we had gymnasts, we had jugglers, you know, it was just a thing to help elementary school kids develop new skills and then showcase it for their parents. And my music teacher came to me and said, you know, Jeremiah, we want you to be the ring announcer for the circus. And I'm like, ring announcer, what does that mean? Is there any talent that's involved? What do I have to do? He's like, you just have to go in front of everybody and speak and entertain and, you know, keep the event going. I'm like, wow, this sounds, and I was always getting in trouble for speaking in class anyways. So maybe that's why they came to me to do it. And uh, so that was my first speaking experience. It was, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Kirk Road Circus. You know, and that's kind of where it started. Um, I liked being in front of people, but more more so I liked bringing joy, you know, taking them to another level, whatever it was, uh, just, just helping people out. And that kind of continued on throughout my life, throughout my professional life, and eventually into real estate and, and where I am today. That's the condensed version. So where did you where did you start in business and 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 how did it how, how did it transcribe and and, and transition okay. excuse me into yeah. real estate and then into speaking? So I started. Uh, I went to school initially. So I'm from Rochester, New York, which is Kodak Town, and right. my father r recognized early that I, I wasn't a person who enjoyed school. So he encouraged me to kind of pick up a trade, and he said, you know, why don't you go to tooling and machining school? Maybe get into mechanical engineering. Um, I did that for about six months. Like I, I apprenticed at a place and I said, there is no way I could do this for the next 30 years of my life. Uh, I, I changed my major to business administration. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew it would be working for myself. And, uh, while I was in college at the time do, doing the business administration, I started working for a security company selling alarm systems door to door. Right. So we literally used to knock on doors and say, excuse me, I have a small problem. I know you can help me with my name's Jeremiah. I'm here with ADT security. Um, we're, you know, and we had a whole script that we would do. I started as a salesperson within two years after I achieved my associate's degree, they actually promoted me to be a district manager. I moved from Rochester, New York to New York city, uh, to Queens. I was at the Queens center mall area. And by the time I left there, I was in charge of all five boroughs, Nassau, Suffolk County, and the Capital District region in Albany. So I had an outside sales force of 60 plus people, a bunch wow. of installers. You know, we, we hit neighborhoods like, like, like Wu Tang, like killer bees on a swarm. We would just, everybody would come in, would, you know, you would right. know that we were there. And my right. job was I would train, I would bring people in, train them, train, recruit, motivate. Um, and solve all the all the problems that that happen on a day to day basis. This is and I was twenty at the time, and from there, then I I I, got, I moved back to Rochester, started my own alarm company, uh, sold that, and got into real estate. So, what was the what was the reason you went from the alarm business to real estate? Uh, initially, my motivation was a bad real estate agent. I'll, uh, I think a lot of people are motivated to get into real estate. They go, man, this guy's making money. And I had a, a really, a really awful experience. You know, I moved back from Queens to Rochester. I bought a HUD house. I overbid by five grand on that property. He didn't tell me that my overbidding meant that I'd had to come out of pocket if I had a FHA financing. So at, at closing, I was short $5,000. 
You know, wow. this, is, this is my first experience with real estate in the Rochester area where I'm from. And the guy was like, well, if you want it, you can come up with five. Like, it was, there was no empathy. No, just it is what it is, kid. You know, because I was only 20, my early 20s at the time. You know, come up with the money or don't. And so that that impression was left on me. And I said, if if he's doing well with my, you know, with my prospecting abilities and my customer service skills, there's no reason I shouldn't excel at this business. Right. So that prompt, you know, that that's what got me started. So, okay, so you get into real estate. Yeah. And tell us about your first year, how you worked it and what was your your target? Because it's a good story. Yeah, I mean, my, my first year, like I, well, you would know my background now with, with door knocking and prospecting right. with thousands of houses door knocked under my belt. I figured I would target for sale by owners. I thought of, of new business that I, I could create expired listings. I felt like I didn't really have, um, the resume yet in the industry to kind of convince expired listings, but I knew for sale by owners had a, a greater chance to list with just about anybody. And so I would go to the house. I would take the red and white signs out out of the yard, and then, <laughs> and then I would I would knock on the door and be like, "Hey, how you doing, it's Jeremiah? You know, Monero with XYZ Realty. I'm just here to help you, right? You guys are looking to sell your home, and and that's what I do. You know, can I? And I would really start just wiping my feet, and they go, "Wait, wait, wait, wait." And then I go into like whatever scripts I had to overcome objections. You know, if I could show you a way where you could walk away with enough money you know, to make your move and still take care of my fee for service. Would you be willing to list today? Yes. Okay. Can I come in? And the other objections that might come up, you know, they're just, they're just objections. They're temporary, temporary areas of concern that we could all overcome because you want to hear so many. So, so you, you, you did pretty good with that then, right? For, yeah. 43 transactions the first year. 43 transactions the first year. How many of those were for sale by owners? No, oh, man. I don't have a, an accurate statistic, but I would say around half. Well, that's or pretty more. Damn good, actually. That's yeah, I mean, good. it's yeah. So what was what was um what was the um the the idea that you basically used to get through the objections? Did you did you practice going through the objections, or did you just talk past the objection? No, I think for me people buy into our personality, right? And, and it's, it's part of what you say, but it's more how you say it. So I could, I could go to the door and say, Hey, I'm here. To, I'm here to help you. I'm a real estate agent. Of course you want me like from a cocky, like, you know, you want me cause I'm a real estate. I'm the best. Or I could say like, Hey, what do you mean? Like, I'm here to help you. I'm a, I'm a realtor. I help people make moves. So why wouldn't you want me to come here today? And so I, I think, Initially, I just thought to myself, and the more people that I encountered, the more I would kind of just study it because that's where you got to be, right. a, you know, a student of the game and say, okay, here's an objection I heard today. Here's how I said it. Did it work or didn't it? And how could I have said it better? You know, because I I was I was a door knocker in the security business, but we heard different objections. Right. But after you knock on enough doors with for sale by owners, or you talk to enough, I felt like it was because my skill set was knocking on doors. It was better for me to do that. But even if you were calling them, and I feel like sometimes calling people is is the it's it's your fear that's keeping you to you know making the phone call rather than knocking on the door because you you're scared if you knock on the door it's face to face and they're gonna slam the door in your face. And if you call them, you're gonna get a voicemail and you feel like that's somewhat of a an attempt at at securing a listing. And I don't I don't believe in that. Well, that's you know it's when I was when I was uh, uh, had my own brokerage. I mean, I would always. Tell people that this thing, well, I would always pick up a different thing called a phone, telephone, that this was our best weapon, right? Exactly. Exactly. This was our best weapon. And the hardest thing that we had to do was to do this, was to actually pick it up. That right. was hard, right? We had to work. Right. It was almost like we had to work out every day. And then right. the hardest thing we had to do was actually dial, right? And then as we're dialing and waiting, we're all saying to ourselves, voicemail, voicemail. Voicemail. Yes, yes. Please let me get a voice or an answering machine, depending on Please, how long. Let me get a voicemail or or wrong number. You know, <laughs> like you have reached the wrong or dead a, a dead number. You know, so it's like you're right. I mean, it it forces you to perform really right and right. to go after what you know and what you practice. Was by the way, was was practice a big thing for you before you went out, or you just went out? Um, I would actually practice in my car. It's, 
you know, I'm not necessarily role playing, but it's almost like an actor reading a script because the, the more you can internalize it, then it becomes part of your dialogue. And it's not like you're at the door going, uh, what, how much too much do you feel it is? Uh, right. If I can give you a choice, you know, and it's like, you want to be like a robot, just like, man, how much too much do you feel it is? Oh, commission. Yeah, I understand exactly how you feel. Many of our happiest clients have felt the same way. But what they found out was by working with me, they're going to net more money. So once you internalize it, it just becomes part of your speech. And some some days I was just you have that confidence built up and it's like, right. miss, whatever you say, I have an answer for. Can I come in, please? I've said that before. They were like, OK, fine, because I'm just I'm I'm likable, which is the, the number one characteristic you want to have at a door. Forget about everything else you say. If they don't like you, they're not going to let you go, period. So I think building that rapport, that first and that first 30 seconds is critical because beyond that, if you don't build that rapport there, you're not going anywhere. You know, you're just a salesperson at the door trying to sell them something. Right. And you were saying, you were saying, and it's so important. People are going to buy the personality of how you do it. It's not what you say, it's how you say, it, which is what you just said. And yeah. the great part about it is, if you go in, you know, if you're going in with your head down, it's it's all it's body language, it's okay. it's 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 everything else. And if you're on an up and you just use your personality, I mean, it, it it works. I mean, actually, you don't have to be that bright or have many scripts. If you're just uh-huh. trying to be their friend, you're going to be able to do. It. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. If you can be their friend, you know, when, depending on how wide they open the door, I'm always looking for little little things that I could associate and build. Oh, you're a Bills fan? Oh man, I'm a Bills fan too. I, I know how you feel, man. I can feel your pain immediately. We're best of friends, you know, walking right. up to the house. There's always little things that you need to pay attention to because we like people who are like us. And so that, I mean, that's the key. Right. And that that's really, that's really a big point is people like that. And that's, and, and, and I'm going to tell you that I believe that real estate agents want to work with the, the person they want to work with really is the person in the mirror. So right. if you can be more like the person you're talking to and assimilate the different right. things in the house, you've got a much better chance to do that. So you, you you go through your business and how many years was it as a real estate agent before you decided, hey, man, I want to speak in front of people. I want to help people. How long was it? Is that a long time? Uh, I want to say it's probably about three or four years into the business uh, because I've, I've always been. Uh, always now I'm not anymore, but I was the younger agent in the office or youngest agent in the office because I started at 25 in real estate. Now I'm younger, you know, like when somebody has a newer kitchen. I'm not yeah, as yeah. young. I'm not as young, but I'm, I'm one of the young people. And so people would come to me with technology questions. And and so it was just kind of a natural progression. Like, hey, could you come speak at our, you know, one of my first events was a Women's Council of Realtors uh, in my local, my local network. And then from there, I did something at my local board, and then I did something um, my my office, and then I just kind of went up from there. For me, I my, you know my father always told me if you're going to do something, don't do it halfway. So I said if I'm if I'm going to be this, a speaker, I'm going to be the very best speaker I can be. So if somebody didn't hire me, I looked at it as okay, I have to improve my skills, be better at what I do until they can't ignore right. me, right? Right. right. And that's, and, and that's I, I first saw you speak down in Atlantic City Triple Play a few years ago. And, and then recently we both were at a Women's Council of Realtors uh, event. So so so, so you're, you're speaking and, and, and a, a lot of times it looks it it's you're trying to help people. And you say you want to try to help everyone. So tell me, how, how do you go about that with your speaking and, and, and all your programs that you have? How do you go about that? What's your what's your main goal in your in your course of action? Well, you know, the same reason I got into real estate, it, we're in a life changing business, right? We're in a business every time I can help somebody achieve the American dream of home ownership, like you change their life. You legitimately change their life. And if you don't believe that, you should get out of real estate. So w- with speaking, it's the same thing. You know, if I can then change the lives of every realtor that I come in contact with, then then the effect is exponential across the industry, right? If I'm at the Women's Council event we did in New Jersey, we have a hundred and 20 people there that's 120 key influencers in their market with a big you know a big sphere of influence i help them be better they then in turn can help thousands of people be better so it's just it's just having a a bigger impact for me because when you know people say tech trainer everybody has a tech trainer in their market everybody has a tech trainer in their office okay and and there's a a national speaker name is carol murray who was kind of one of my mentors she came to me one day and said, do you want to 
just be a tech trainer. You have to think more about what it is you really do. And when I thought about that, it was really that I help people overcome their fears and really step out of their comfort zones. You know, part of what I do when I'm not working, I do a lot of obstacle course racing, Spartan racing, Tough mutters, those kind of. And all of that is about being comfortable, being uncomfortable. And if I can share that, that mindset with you as a realtor, then who cares about live video? Who cares about anything? Because you know that you have to do this in order to grow and expand in your business. You have to get uncomfortable at some point. But you know as well as I do that, you know, the, the uncomfortability is, 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 uh, builds excuses and it builds uh, negativity in agents to actually do something. So let's just talk about video for a second, right? So everybody's going to yeah. say, every, people say, well, I got to do video because everybody's doing video or, you know, this is the year of video. Well, that's been the year of video for I mean, 10 years, right? right? So, I yeah. mean, but how do you, I mean, I've always, I mean, one of the things I remember Katie Lance saying is, um, look, if you're worried about the way you look or the way you sound, that's the way you look. That's the way you sound. Get over it. What's how is there another way to talk about that and get people to do it? Um, no, I mean that's two of my my two of my taglines are it's how you look, and then the second one is get over yourself because we are our own worst critics. We right. are our own worst critics. When you start doing video, you put yourself in a vulnerable place, and really, what you're saying is, I'm scared that if I share the true tr my true self with the world, that they're not going to like me. And I think it, it's called self-esteem for a reason. It's self-esteem. Like if you like you, then all that, that's all that matters. Keep creating content and it's consistency over time that's going to make a difference. You're going to see that the people who really care about you are going to support you and, and they're going to encourage you to keep doing it. The ones that in the beginning that are going to be hating on you, those aren't your friends. And if you have people on your Facebook that are, that are saying things or doing things, then get rid of them. You surround, you know, surround yourself with positive people and they're going to lift you up. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because people talk about, well, I want to do it, but I just, you know, they don't get to it and stuff. And, and I watched one of your videos over the past week knowing that we we're going to be on. And, man, something just, just came out and punched me in the face and just made it made, made so much impact on me that I'm starting to use it. Sorry, but I'm using it. And I actually actually uh, um, I used it in a, in, a, in, a, in a post, I think, today, and I did tag you in it. Desire without discipline equals disappointment. disappointment. Yeah. When we talk about the desire, everybody's got the desire to do it. I also did a quick video uh, for Instagram and Facebook this morning. You did the same thing. And then the odd thing about this, Jeremiah, is that I, I, I read little passages every day. Mm -hmm. And guess what today's was about? It was about desire and discipline. I said, holy crap, this is like jumping all over me. Yeah. Right? So yeah. go, go into that a bit, desire without discipline. I mean, it, it sounds pretty simple, but please explain a little bit more for, for people that will watch it to help them out. Yeah, so I think now's a good time for you because everybody wants to say, well, start of the new year, the start of the new year, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, right? And so it's the desire without discipline means like you want it or do you just sort of want it? Right? Like I say, why well, I want to be successful. Well, if I told you you had to do three videos per week for the rest of your life, to be successful, would you do it? You'd be like, oh, well, I don't like, then you don't want it bad enough, right? Right? Because there's days for me, and you'll, you could you could attest to this as well, where we don't feel like doing a video. There's days, right. like before I, 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 like I had been sick all week and I got to speak at three different places in a row in three different cities. But you know what? I, I have the desire with the discipline, meaning no matter what, if I commit to something, there's nothing that will stop me. And, and so that's when you have that mindset that like, this is what I want to do. And everything else is just an excuse, right? Because you're, you're having an, an argument with yourself in your head every single day from when you wake up. I get up at 4.30 in the morning, and it's not easy some days. And some days I'm like, oh, I want to sleep. Some day, eh. And so I, every morning when I wake up early, I post you know, and I, with, the, with the hashtag win the wake up because I, that's where it starts. I won the wake up. I have the discipline. Then I do a workout. Then I do my work, my work day. Because, like, for me, that's a victory. And if you can win each, not going to win every single day, but if you can win the majority of the days, then you, you have that desire. And the discipline is what's going to motivate you because, you know, it's very easy to stay motivated when everything is sunshiny, right? When the world is going great, all your listings are selling, the market is spectacular. But guess what? That's not going to last forever. There's going to be a downshift. Your market's going to change. And if, if you're not disciplined in what you're doing, you're going to be out of business. I, I, I think a lot of us, I, I agree with you 100%. I think a lot of us, 
And a lot of it is all about what's here, right? So I, I've been I've been trying to make a really huge shift over the past really month, right? So one of them is is that so I, I being in the Northeast, we close our pools. So I had right. my pool open late because I had some family coming for my daughter's wedding and stuff, and I wanted it to be beautiful, right? So I yeah. said, okay, I'm going to close it on Halloween. Guy calls me two days ago. He says, David, we can't come because it's going to rain all day. I said, oh no, I just cleaned the whole thing. So last night with all the wind and stuff, leaves. I mean, it is just covered in leaves, right? I So instead of saying, well, I really don't want to do this, oh, shit, and bone, and I said, you know what? Let's go. We got to get it done. We know how to do it. Not a big deal. So it's a shift in your head. I'm not saying mindset. It's a shift in your head and your brain. Yeah. And it's also like goals, commitment, desire, discipline, right? right? A goal without a commitment is just a dream and a hope. But right. your commitment really goes to it, which is discipline, right? I always tell people, I say, what was your goal for the past year? Uh, it was a hundred thousand. Um, how much did you make? Fifty thousand. Well, you committed to fifty thousand. You didn't commit to a hundred thousand. That's right. called discipline. Would you agree with what I just uh, went oh, through? <laughs> one, yeah, one hundred percent. You know, so um, so there's a lot of other things that you've been doing. Tell us more about you know your speaking and. And you've done a lot of different interesting things. You said you were doing some stuff with um, with a, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency. You want to talk about that a little bit? That's kind of fun. Yeah. So, so if you're you're headed to NAR, uh, my 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 I'll post it in the comments of, of the video. But uh, November 9th on Saturday, 3 p.m. I don't know the exact location, but I'm doing blockchain and cryptocurrency hyper history in the making. Uh, so it's a 60 minute session. It's not going to go too deep because you can't go too deep with that because it'll be a black hole we will never come out of. But it, it's we're going to give you enough information to talk intelligently with your clients because I believe it is history in the making. And we have to educate ourselves on what's coming down the road. We can't put our, our heads in the sand and go, this isn't happening. Well, what if it does happen? And what if your client comes to you and says, I want to buy this million dollar property using Bitcoin? Can you help me? And you go, ah, ah, ah. You know, come to the session, learn more about it, educate yourself. You know, even me being a, a tech guy, I'm I'm learning every day. Every day you have to kind of stay on the cutting edge because you never know what client you're going to run into and, and you want to be your best. So just just tell us really quickly. I, I mean, if you if you have, have a customer and they come to you and say, yeah. well, I've got a million dollars in Bitcoin. I want to buy a house. I mean, yeah. how, what's how, what's the what, what do they do? It just like if you're you had a client that came to you and said, I had a million dollars in a 401k plan. What do I do? We cash it out and we buy the real estate. That's right? all so that, that's really to overly simplify it. Yeah, that's all there is to it, um, because they would cash it out at the time that they want to, you know, because Bitcoin goes like this. Let's say I, I taught it in September. It was at nine thousand three hundred and something dollars for one Bitcoin. I then went to update it uh, in in. October, early October, I want to say something like that. It was at like 7,000 and some change. And then I went to update it just two days ago. It's back up to 9,000. So you can't go in the contract saying I'll buy this property for a hundred Bitcoin because 30 days from now that, that value for a hundred Bitcoin would be drastically, could be drastically different. So it's really just verify funds. We need liquid. You would, you know, use something like Coinbase to cash it out. They charge you. 1% of the transaction, which is less than a credit card, less than, you know, a lot of these other, if you were, if you were taxing out a 401k pre-tax dollars, shoot, you'd be paying, you know, 30%. So it's, it, it's new. People aren't used to it, but you know, in some of the larger markets, they even have Bitcoin ATMs. So it's, really? it's def yeah, it's definitely on the horizon. Um, there's, there's places that are accepting it as payment. Uh, you'll, you'll see, uh, Wyoming has passed. 15 crypto related laws uh, in the last year. They're looking to be one of the, uh, let's call them the crypto capital of the United States to help boost banks and, and, you know, being located there and boost business and boost their economy. So, um, so when we talk about Bitcoin is also something we, I, I use a, a phrase blockchain. Yeah. Right. A lot of people don't understand that and how that can be used could you just briefly go into sure. blockchain and how it can be yeah. used, what it can be used for? Yeah, so a blockchain is just like an open ledger. A ledger is just a history of things that have happened. 
uh, and it's open source so everybody can see it. Imagine if we had all of our real estate transaction on the open market, everybody can see it. That builds trust and also builds security because without getting into how the chain works, it's, it's very complex to build a chain. There's a number of people that are doing it to build these chains. And so in order for, for a hacker to get into the chain, it would be next to impossible with the amount of computing power um, and resources and, and energy really required to do it. Um, in real estate, we could do it with our real estate transactions. There's, and I'll say this, um, Teton County, which is like where Jackson Hole, Wyoming is. Yes. They are They are the first county in the United States to add, because they had already digitized their titles, first county in the United States to add their titles to a blockchain. So now it's it's verifiable ownership of property, which if you think about it for just one second, how crazy real estate is that we make everybody get insurance, right? We make a buyer get insurance and, and then well not make, but we ask them to and they typically do. And, and the bank makes you get insurance, title insurance, on the fact that we may have made a mistake, right? Right? There may be a mistake in title. We're not sure. We're pretty sure we did our job, but we're charging you insurance in case we didn't. Right? I mean, I think that's that's one of the big with blockchain. That's they can do that, with, and they're doing it with medical records. All different industries are going to be affected by this. I mean, obviously, some of our counties aren't as advanced technologically as others as far as digitizing their deeds and their and the and the title work in that. So I think some areas it might be five or ten years down the road, but Wyoming's very progressive, and I know uh, Vermont is also a test market uh, for a company called Propy, P R O P Y. I want to say who's also putting uh, they're putting their transactions on a, a blockchain type format. So, 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 so wait a minute. So you're saying that we can put the the, the title history, the deed history, the ownership history, all in a in, in a in a blockchain ledger. Correct. And would that circumvent the need for ins for title insurance? Maybe, maybe, and probably for sure. <laughs> Pro maybe, probably for sure is what I'll say without being definitive. But I, I would say yes because I mean, if you look at how it is now with ti just title work in general, like we gave you your abstract thirty years ago. Do you still have it? I don't know many people except you know, I'll I'll say generations older than me to take it and put it in a safe, but. You know, millennials, we take that stuff and we put it in a pile of stuff somewhere, hopefully in a safe or in a filing cabinet. But you're going to move 20 or 30 years later. Nobody can locate the abstract, you know, and, and, and sometimes the attorneys have a we had a big problem here in Rochester where the abstract company who had a ton of abstracts went out of business. They went oh, out wow. of business and all of their abstracts were locked in a building because there was like a foreclosure process or something. I don't remember exactly the details to it, but. You know, so all of these things, because it's private, that's where, where, where the issues come in. And I think when you have a public, you know, a public le uh, ledger that everybody has access to, it, it's going to definitely eliminate the need for that. But then also the time that it takes to investigate all the title work, because that's what holds up. You know, I know downstate where we're at in New York, it, it can take a little time. But in upstate, our average transactions take 60 days, you know, if there's financing involved. So if somebody was purchasing a property with Bitcoin and the title was on blockchain, it could take a day, two days. So, okay. So, so title I get, I understand to be able to look it up. Yeah. There it is. What about other industries in our, in, in, in our business? And, and, and one of the things I've heard is, and talked to other people about is actually utilizing blockchain for our MLSs. Have you heard of that? Is that anything that, that makes sense to you? You know, I mean, just to put our stuff up there so it's there for all to see. Man, I, I, I'm I not sure about that. So I'm not even okay. going to take a position. Um, but I, I, I could definitely see how that might be an application. But I, I think there would be so many millions of people that would have to buy into that, um, that it, it might be an uphill challenge. Where if you're talking about like, counties buying into it for title work i think that would be an easier progression than okay. you know 1.4 million people who haven't bought into the concept of blockchain yet to then get them to buy into a blockchain mls but i think maybe you know 10 years from now we could have the same conversation and be talking about blockchain mls nationwide who knows yeah so so you're going to be speaking at nar just about that topic blockchain and cryptocurrency 
tell us about tell us about the other the basis of of your speaking and your training and your coaching that you have online and everything else. Tell us your base for that and, and the different programs you have. Yeah. So, I mean, all, all my programs are listed on my website. It's jmanseminars.com slash programs. But the, the majority of what I do is technology, social media, and video. You know, I like to say social media and video really are what I get my top, probably 90% of my engagements when people want me to talk about because I do it in a different way. I am a real estate practitioner. The stuff that I talk about is real life. If you follow me on social media, I'm going to teach you the same things that I do. Uh, I'm not somebody who teaches theory and says, this is what you should be doing on social media. And then you follow them on social media and they're not doing anything. They don't have a following. They don't have any kind of engagement. So I'm, I'm a feet on the street kind of a person. And, you know, as far as coaching is concerned, I don't really do any coaching. And I feel like as a speaker, I just want to be a speaker. I want to right. give you everything that I know. Right. Right. And, and then even after the fact with messenger, I have a lot of messenger bots set up with keywords. Um, I will give you more resources for free, you know, because then you'll see the value in what I offer. And then maybe you'll refer me to somebody to hire me for speaking. That, that's how I look at it. I, I hate myself when I go to, a, you know, I see somebody speak and they're doing a great job. And then all of a sudden there's like a pitch. Yep. Like, hey, it's, it's almost like you had me. And then at the end, oh, man, why would you do that? Like, I was good until you, you pitched me on something. And it's like, just just tell me stuff because you want to help me. And, and that's the basis for what I do. I, I really want to help people. And when people reach out to me after the fact, you know, it takes me five or ten minutes to answer a question. If that can help you in your business or change your life, then 100 percent I'm going to do it. And I do the same thing for speakers. Anybody that's on the come up that wants to speak, even if they're in the same, you know, they do technology. People come to me. I do technology, social media, and video. Fantastic. How can I help you? Because it's it's not just what I talk about. It's how I deliver it. We are, we're all different. We all have different spheres. And we all have different yeah. skill sets that we bring to the table. And the rising tide raises all boats, you know, helping each other get better. We're all going to get better. So, so let me ask you a question that I, that I get from time to time. Actually, I get it a lot is when it comes to social media, a lot of people say, well, I don't have the time to do it. <laughs> should I hire someone to do it for me or should I use hood suite or something like that? T talk to me about that. Cause that's really yeah. a big question I always get. That, that's a great one. Um, and I, and I get that quite often too. My answer is no, you shouldn't hire somebody to do it. Unless, like I, I have somebody that works with us in the office. She's our operations manager, Amy. She's part of our team. She works on our, our team page, but she gets us. She understands us, the, our dynamic, how we speak, how I am, how sarcastic I am, how I joke, how I can be silly sometimes. So she posts along with us on our real estate team page. Uh, my speaking page, my personal page, I would never hire that out because, again, people buy into us. It's our right. personality. It's how you post. It's everything that you're putting out there. That's all the content. That's the real you. Authenticity is what sells. And and I wouldn't. I never would. And and then as far as the Hootsuite and that, there's different messages on different platforms. I don't like to syndicate across different platforms because everyone has a different message, right? If you're on LinkedIn, it should be more business to business. If you're on Facebook, you know, it's 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 more social. If I'm on, on Instagram. It's, it's a different message. You know, I have videos that I post on Instagram television that that's the only place you will see them. You know, just like if you go to Netflix, it's net, it's a Netflix original. Well, I have IGTV originals. It's like a different, you know, because why am I going to tune into your different channels if you have the same stuff posted all across, you know, all across the different platforms? That's fantastic. I, I, I like that point because there's one thing that I've, I've, I've tried to 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 make a point of through what I do is. Tell people that, you know, you've got to be original on each different channel. You need to be consistent, but I don't mean what you're posting because if someone's on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and they go there and they see the same stuff that you're posting there, they're going to learn to ignore you just Absolutely. like they learn to watch you, right. right? So let's not help people ignore us. Let's help people watch us and be interesting somewhere else. Well, uh, you know, uh, 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 Jeremiah, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Tell me how do you mentioned earlier, but how do people contact you and, your, and, 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 and to get you to come speak for them and ask you questions? Yeah. So my website is jmanseminars.com. But if you, I have a link tree created at jmansocialmedia.com and that will give you the links to all of my social media, um, you know, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, 
you know, follow me everywhere. Again, if you have any questions, it, it's my pleasure to help you. Uh, I'm not going to try to sell you anything. I'm not, I don't do coaching. So, you know, reach out and, and let me help you be better and we can, you know, make the industry better together. So if there's one thing that you'd like to end this conversation we're having with today to help people, what would that be from what we talked about? All right. So I have this quote. It's, it's, I'm looking at it because it's right at my desk here. It says, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact. It's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration. It's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. Amazing. I love that. Absolutely love that. And and look, man, send that to me because I, I, didn't, get, I didn't get it all. Look, I, I, I know, first of all, first of all, thank you. Second of all, I know what I had. To, I mean, we had trouble getting in touch with you. Yeah, exactly. Here it is. All right. All right. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Everybody wants this hat. I mean, all from, about the hat. from Lee Brown, Steve Harney, all these people and Chris Smith, they all wanted the hat. I mean, Chris Smith is, I mean, he's got his his, uh, his 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 red sneakers, which I heard that he's retiring, um, but uh, you never know. Well, I lost you. Thank you so much for coming on, and you just went black. I don't know if you're still there or not. I'm here. I'm here. But, I'm here. Uh, I'm and I just did too. But we're still broadcasting. Thanks so much for coming on.